Chapter five, the giant killers. Let's make a prediction together on who the giants are. I think there are two meanings to this. We call that a pun, two meanings. We know that probably there will be giants in their pretend world of Terabithia that they're going to have to overtake. But based on the fact that they've been bullied by Janice Avery, what prediction can the reader make about what might happen in chapter five? Hint, they're not going to physically hurt or kill anyone. Leslie liked to make up stories about the giants that threatened the peace of Terabithia, but they both knew that the real giant in their lives was Janice Avery. Were you able to make that prediction? If so, good for you. They're going to need to take down Janice Avery. Let's see how they do that. Of course, it wasn't only Jess and Leslie that she was after. She had two friends, Wilma Dean and Bobby Sue Henshaw, who were almost as big as she was, and the three of them would roam the playground, grabbing up hopscotch rocks, running through the jump ropes, and laughing while second graders screamed. They would even stand outside the girls' room first thing every morning and make the little girls give them their milk money before they'd let them go to the bathroom. Maybell, unfortunately, was a slow learner. Her daddy had brought her a package of Twinkies, and she was so proud that as soon as she got on the bus, she forgot everything she knew and yelled to another first grader, guess what? I got in my lunch today, Billie Jean. What? Twinkies! She shouted so loud, you could have heard her in the back seat, even if you were deaf in both ears. So we already know if someone is deaf, it doesn't matter how loud you shout. The person so, is not going to hear two. you. What kind of figurative language is the author using by exaggerating and saying that Maybell shouted the word Twinkie so loud that even somebody in the back seat who was deaf could hear when obviously, literally, they couldn't? Out of the corner of his eye, Jess thought he saw Janice Avery perk up. When they sat down, Maybelle was still screeching about her dadgum Twinkies over the roar of the motor. My daddy brought them to me from Washington! Jess threw another look at the back seat. You better shut up about those dang Twinkies, he said in her ear. You just jealous because daddy didn't bring you none. Number two. Why did Jess tell his little sister Maybelle to shut up about the Twinkies? Was he just jealous? Was Maybelle right? Or could there have been another reason? Think about it. Janice Avery was listening to everything. Okay, he shrugged across her head at Leslie to say, I warned her, didn't I? And Leslie nodded back. Neither of them was too surprised to see Maybelle come screaming toward them at recess. What do you predict happened to Maybelle? Why is she screaming? She stole my Twinkies! Jess sighed. Maybelle, didn't I tell you? You've got to kill Janet Avery! Kill her! Kill her! Kill her! Shh, Leslie said, stroking Maybelle's head. But Maybelle didn't want comfort. She wanted revenge. Let's look at this word, revenge. Most of you know what it means, but just in case, let's look at the context around it. Leslie tried to calm her down, and Maybelle didn't want comfort or to be calmed. She wanted revenge. So we know the context is, if she didn't want this, she did want that. We know that they are going to be opposites, or at least not be the same word. Let's go to the next sentence. You got to beat her up into a million pieces. So obviously, she wants to get her. sooner tangle with Miss Godzilla herself. Fighting ain't gonna get back nothing, Maybelle. Them Twinkies is well on the way to padding Janice Avery's bottom by now. That grammar was terrible and it's gonna give me nightmares. I'm just kidding. But it really was bad grammar. Does the author have bad grammar? No. She's the author. We know that she did that on purpose. She used all that bad grammar on purpose. Do you remember when we read Tuck Everlasting and 
the author was using all kinds of crazy grammar, and you guys call that country, um, in having the tech family talk. What purpose did that serve? Hopefully you answered that it was so that the author could give a voice to the character and make them sound real, make them sound country. Think about that as you answer this question. Why did this author, Catherine, Catherine Patterson, use such terrible grammar in that last sentence? Leslie snickered, but Maybelle was not distracted. You're just yeller, Jess Aarons. If you wasn't yeller, you'd beat somebody up if they took your little sister's Twinkies. She broke into a fresh round of sobbing. Use the context clues around this word, yeller, to determine its meaning. She says, you're yeller if you wasn't, and there we go again at the bad grammar on purpose, if you wasn't yeller, you'd beat somebody up if they took your little sister's Twinkies. Based on these context clues, what does yeller mean? She broke into a fresh round of sobbing. Jess stiffened. He avoided Leslie's eyes. More, there was no escape. He'd have to fight the female gorilla now. Look, Maybelle, Leslie was saying, if Jess picks a fight with Janice Avery, you know perfectly well what will happen. Maybelle wiped her nose on the back of her hand. She'll beat him up. No, he'll get kicked out of school for fighting a girl. You know how Mr. Turner is about boys who pick on girls. She stole my Twinkies. I know she did, Maybelle. And Jess and I are going to figure out a way to pay her back for it. Aren't we, Jess? He nodded vigorously. Anything was better than promising to fight Janice Avery. What you gonna do? I don't know yet. We'll have to plan it out very carefully. But I promise you, Maybelle, we'll get her. Cross your heart and hope to die. Leslie solemnly crossed her heart. Maybelle turned unexpectedly, turned expectantly to Jess. So he crossed his too, trying hard not to feel like a fool, crossing his heart to a first grader in the middle of the playground. Maybelle snuffed loudly. <sighs> it ain't as good as seeing or be to a million pieces. No, said Leslie, I'm sure it isn't. But with Mr. Turner running this school, it's best if we can do it, right, Jess? Right. That afternoon, crouched in the stronghold of Terabithia, they held a council of war. How to get Janice Avery without ending up squashed or suspended. That was their problem. Maybe we could get her caught doing something. Leslie was trying out another idea after they had both rejected putting honey on her bus seat and glue in her hand lotion. You know, she smokes in the girls' room. If we could just get Mr. Turner to walk past while the smoke is pouring out, Jess shook his head hopelessly. It wouldn't take her five minutes to find out who squawked. That was the moment that the silence, while they were both considered what Janice Avery might do to anyone who reported her to the principal. We gotta get her without knowing who done it. Yeah, Leslie chewed away at a dried apricot. You know what girls like Janice hate most? What? Being made a fool of. Jess remembered how Janice had looked the day that he'd made everyone laugh at her on the bus. Jess was right. There was a crack in the old hippo hide. Yeah, he nodded, beginning to smile. Yeah, do we go about, do we get her about being fat? How about, Leslie began slowly, how about boys? Who's she stuck on? Willard Hughes, I reckon. Every girl in the seventh grade slides to the ground when he walks by. You know anybody at school who makes everybody slide to the ground? Yeah, Leslie's eyes were shining. The plan came all in a rush. We write her a note, you see, and pretend it's from Willard. Jess was already getting a pencil from the cat and yanking a piece of notebook paper out from under a rock. He handed them to Leslie. No, you write. My handwriting is too good for Willard Hughes. What do you know about Willard Hughes's handwriting? He got set and waited. Okay, she said, um, dear Janice. No, dearest Janice. Jess hesitated, doubtful. Believe me, Jess, she'll eat it up. Okay, dearest Janice. Don't worry about punctuation or anything. We have to make it look as if Willard Hughes really wrote it. 
Okay, dearest Janice, maybe you won't believe me, but I love you. You think she'll? He asked as he wrote it down. I told you, she'll eat it up. Girls like Janice Avery believe just what they want to in this kind of situation. Okay, now, if you say you do not love me, it will break my heart. So please don't. If you love me as much as I love you, my darling, hold it. I can't write that fast. Leslie waited, and when he looked up, she continued in a moony voice. Meet me behind the school this afternoon after school. Do not worry about missing your bus. I want to walk home with you and talk about us. Put us in capitals. My darling, love and kisses, Willard Hughes. Kisses? Yeah, kisses. Put a little row of X's in there, too. She paused, looking over his shoulder while he finished. Okay, put P.S. He did. Um, don't tell anybody. Don't tell nobody. Just like the author did on purpose, Leslie stopped and corrected her good grammar to make it bad grammar. Why did Leslie Let do that? Love be a secret for only us two right now. Why'd you put that in? So she'll be sure to tell somebody, stupid. Leslie reread the note, nodding approval. Good, you've misspelled believe and two. She studied it a minute longer. Gee, I'm pretty good at this. Um, do you think Jess misspelled this on purpose? I do not. <laughs> sure, you probably had some big secret love down in Arlington. Jess Herons, I'm gonna kill you. Hey girl, you kill the king of Terabithia and you're in trouble. Regicide, she said proudly. Reg what? Did I ever tell you the story of Hamlet? He rolled over to his back. Not yet, he said happily. Lord, he loved Leslie's stories. Someday, when he was good enough, he would ask her to write them in a book and let him do all the pictures. Well, she began. There was once a prince of Denmark named Hamlet. In his head, he drew the shadowy castle with the tortured prince pacing the parapets. How could you make a ghost come out of the fog? Crayons wouldn't do. Of course, with the paints, you could put one thin color on top of another so that you would begin to see a pale figure moving from deep inside the paper. He began to shiver. He knew he could do it if Leslie would let him use, his, use her paint. Remember, his deepest love is art. The hardest part of the plan to get Janice Avery was to plant the note. They sneaked into the building the next morning before the bell, first bell. Leslie went several yards ahead so that if they were caught, no one would think they were together. Mr. Turner was death on boys and girls he caught sneaking around the halls together. She got to the door of the seventh grade classroom and peeked in. Then she signaled Jess to come ahead. The hairs prickled on his neck. Lord, how will I find her desk? I thought you knew where she sat. He shook his head. I guess you'll have to look in every one you find it until you find it. Hurry, I'll be the lookout for you. She closed the door quietly and left him shuffling through each desk, trying to be careful not to make a mess but his stupid hands were shaking so much he could hardly pull anything out to look for names. Suddenly, he heard Leslie's voice. Oh, Miss Pierce, I've just been standing here waiting for you. Lord, seventh grade teacher was right out there in the hall, heading for this room. He stood frozen. He couldn't hear what Miss Pierce was saying back to Leslie through the closed door. Yes, ma'am. This is a very interesting nest on the south end of the building. And since Leslie raised her voice even louder, you know so much about science. I was hoping you could take a minute to look at it with me and tell me what built it. Why is she yelling? She doesn't, she's trying to give the hint to Jess and give him a heads up that Miss Pierce is there. There was a mumble of a reply. Oh, thank you, Miss Pierce. Leslie was practically screaming. It won't take but a minute. And it would mean so much to me. How long did she just give code to Jess that he has? Yep. One minute. As soon as he heard their retreating footsteps, he flew around the remaining desks until joy he found one with a composition book that had Janice Avery's name on it. He stuffed the note on top of everything else in the side of the desk and raced out of the room to the boys' room where he hid in one of the stalls until the bell rang to go to, go to homeroom. At recess time, Janice Avery was in a tight huddle with Wilma and Bobby Sue. Then, and instead of teasing the little girls, the three of them wandered off arm in arm to watch the big boys' football. As the trio passed, Jess could see Janice's face all pink and prideful. 
He rolled his eyes at Leslie and she rolled hers back to him. As the bus was about to pull out that afternoon, one of the seventh grade boys, Billy Morris, sh yelled up to Miss Prentice that Janice Avery wasn't on the bus yet. It's okay, Miss Prentice, Wilma Dean called up. She ain't riding this evening. Then in a loud whisper, reckon you all know Janice has a heavy date with you know who. Who? asked Billy. Willard Hughes. He's so crazy about her. He can't hardly stand it. He's even walking her all the way home. Yeah, while well, the 304 just pulled out with Willard Hughes on the back seat. If he's got a big date, he don't seem to know much about it. You lie, Billy Morris. Billy yelled a cuss word and the entire back seat plunged into a heated discussion as to whether Janice Avery and Willard Hughes were or were not in love and were or were not seeing each other secretly. As Billy got off the bus, he hollered to Wilma, you just better tell Janice that that Willard is going to be mad when he hears what she's spreading all over school. Wilma's face was crimson as she screamed out the window. Okay, you dummy, you talk to Willard. You'll see. Just ask him about that letter. You'll see. Poor old Janice Avery, Jess said as they sat in the ca castle later. Poor old Janice. She deserves everything she gets and then some. I reckon, he said, but still, oh, he's, he feels a little guilty, doesn't he? Leslie looked stricken. You're not very sorry we did it, are you? No, I reckon we had to do it, but still. Still what? He grinned. Maybe I got this thing for Janice like you got a thing for killer whales. Meaning maybe he's feeling a little bit sorry for Janice, like she feels sorry for killer whales. She punched him in the shoulder. Let's go out and find some giants or, or walking dead to fight. I'm sick of Janice Avery. The next day, Janice Avery stomped onto the bus, her eyes daring everyone in sight to say a word. Leslie nudged Maybelle. Maybelle's eyes went wide. Did ya? Shh! Yes! Maybelle turned completely around and stared at the back seat. Then she turned back and poked Jess. You made her that mad? Jess nodded, trying to move his head as little as possible as he did so. We wrote that letter, Leslie whispered. But you mustn't tell anyone or she'll kill us. I know, said Maybelle, her eyes shining. That's the end of chapter five. Tune in next week to find out what Janice does best.